Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain, you're listening to the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us today are Attica and Eno, so get ready and strap in, because it's been a while. I've had some allergy issues, but this week we are back with a vengeance. To begin, I have a great clip that many of you may have seen, but not, might not exactly know the context here, and we wanted to unpack that story for you. So tonight... We're going to start with the clip that took anarchist and communist Twitter by storm. All right, I don't got long. I'm a dad, so I got a kid to take care of. What's up, bootlickers? I haven't seen y'all since the camp out. I got something to say, right? I'm tired of this fucking shit. I'm a father, I'm a veteran, and I'm anarchist. Those are three people you don't want to piss off, all right? I'm tired of children getting attacked in the streets. I'm tired of them sleeping in the fucking streets. I'm tired sure, of seeing the very in people here, sure. that I swore to defend... Get attacked by the state. So like I said out there, y'all need to close your fucking beaks and start moving your feet and get shit done. Take resources and put them in the hands of the people who need them. All right? Seriously. The fuck is wrong with y'all? Yeah! Who the fuck are y'all to justify letting people die in the streets with your policies and your laws and your legislation? How do you justify that, killing people? I swore to give my life to defend the people from all forms of oppression, eventually this shit's gonna stop. Because it's our turn, we will make excuses for the terror. Marks. Our next speaker is Lauren, Lauren Tazi, followed by Rachel Ledwick. So I have to wonder if Lauren was just as energized. <laughs> A hard act to follow. The vitriol, the invective, the fire and fury, I'm pretty sure that every single member of our community has felt that at some point. And I would suspect that most of us feel that most of every day we're alive. And the man got to go up there in front of elected officials, in front of a crowd of his peers, and voice those concerns in exactly the tone that all of us would love to use on our bosses and our elected officials and everybody that we consider uh, bootlickers. And that is, that is just a beautiful thing. One thing, and I don't know if either of you noticed, for the officials, the most important part of that was there were children there, and so the decorum had to be maintained. That was their worry, not the homeless people in the streets. It's sad, though, because this, like, this happens a lot. Like, there are plenty, like, literally every, every law that has to be passed by a state assembly, city council, et cetera, et cetera, has to have an open comment section. Rarely is it such a theatrical thing where they're sitting in the literal legislative room like as my tie my brief period as a liberal thinking that going to these open comment whatever's made a difference talking to your representative whatever the sad thing is that this is so rare right although who knows if in the next months there won't be like one of these kind of things every day right but for every law that's passed there's an open comment section it's not like this is the first law that's past that is fucked people over like the, those pass daily and so i guess maybe it's because this was such a theatrical thing like they were in the main you know legislative city council room and it was a law that was very publicized this tax that was going to go towards hoping homeless people that then got repealed because the corporations didn't want it it just kind of saddens me that it's so rare that's actually what I wanted to to go over because a lot of people may have seen this clip but not know exactly what it was in, in regards to. So basically what's going on here is that the city council of Seattle voted down a head tax, uh, which was a tax that was on businesses per employee. And it was only the large businesses that really had to pay it, Amazon, Starbucks, and a few others. And so... A bunch of businesses got together, Amazon and Starbucks and a company called Vulcan contributed $25,000 each towards stomping this thing out and running campaigns to basically propagandize against this particular tax. And the thing was, the tax itself was originally a $500 head tax. It would have brought in the city about twenty million dollars, and they were able to negotiate it down to two seventy-five. And then Amazon said, "Well, you know that's okay, but you know we are working on construction on this building. We could just stop if you don't fully revoke it." It's really interesting because 
this is a case where Amazon, with their Block 18 office tower, I believe, they literally leveraged that against the city. They said, well, you, you can play ball or we can move somewhere else. They said they had halted progress on its construction, and that progress on the construction, the, 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 the resuming of that construction, was pending the outcome of their vote, and that's when they compromised, dropped it down to $275, Per employee, and that's, and reading the uh, the the press statements from Starbucks in particular, talking about no tax on jobs campaign going through and uh, having the the head tax killed, it's really interesting to see this pattern repeating itself. Because looking back historically, it seems like plutocrats and organizations that employ and are headed by plutocrats, they always seem to think that being taxed and having their tax dollars utilized for social reform programs and such is an inherently inferior solution to whatever solution they have. Starbucks, Vulcan, and Amazon have cooked up their own plan that they say goes along with the guidelines. That is interesting. That's what they always say is like, oh, we could do a better in the private sector. But every time we let the private sector do something, more than not, it turns out to just not work. Whether it's school choice, whether it's roads, it doesn't really matter. Usually when something's held over to the private sector, it gets crappier and it gets more expensive over time. It may start out cheap, but they continually ask more and more money and cut back on services that they deliver. And you can see the logic from their perspective. They say, well, we're a business. We know how to save money and we'll do it more cheaply. They say, we're a business, and this would be good optics for us. You know, we want people to know that we care about them more than the contents of their wallet. And, and they say, we know what we're doing. We, we, we've taken part in these social reform programs. Remember our, uh, remember our LGBT programs? Those were great. Those genuinely helped people. And we can do this while also turning a buck and therefore funding ourselves rather than asking somebody for a handout like the government does. Paying taxes and charity are two different things, and you can do both. And if you do charity, then you can get tax breaks. So it's it's not mutually exclusive here. And these people make enough money where they can do both. But one thing I, di I did want to add on to uh, this story here, before we, we move on to our next topic here, there is, is one thing, though, that uh, the a good anarchist uh, did say to the city council that basically, like, if, if they're refusing to do it, then we got to do something. So maybe we do need to get out on the streets and procure solutions for homeless people, things like creating them tiny homes that the city of Seattle doesn't want to do it because that's what they actually had planned for them. And they're not even going to have that. And that's shown to be really effective in mitigating the problem, even more so than shelters, which are actually a more expensive solution. It really goes to show that they're not, as far as homelessness goes, they're not really interested in fixing the problem as so much simply because homelessness is there as a tool to make the working class afraid of no longer working. Uh, one thing I kind of wanted to mention about it in, in terms of how he went up there and how he expressed himself is he was blunt, he was concise, he was to the point, but he straight up said, I am an anarchist, I am a veteran. You would think with the social dynamics of America that the two are diametrically opposed, and I really think that that kind of exposure for our movement is very important. He's saying we are out there, we are numerous, we will be hurt. There are solutions that we want to implement. You are failing to do so. And there are enough of us to collectively express our disagreement with your failure to implement those systems. This is not a matter that will go away. This is not a matter that will be swept under the rug. We are here. We are watching. We are listening. And we will be part of this. That's actually a, a great point to, to drive home here uh, is the fact that, yeah, he, he was a veteran and he, he did say that. And that kind of does go to show that this movement is growing and it is hitting normal people. It's it's getting the normies, if you will, like the, the 4chan parlance. Notice how, like, the alt-right was completely quiet about that. Like, he wasn't some skinny, like, purple-haired twink that they could easily write off as, oh, 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 it's just one of those college leftists. Like, here he was in his fucking army uniform telling them how it is, and they just, they're just silent. 
Well, of course, because that would counter their narrative. That's another thing why I'm not scared of their little, like, militia bullshit. Because, like, they psych themselves into thinking, oh, those leftists are going to be, you know, cannon father. They're all, like, skinny college twinks who, like, fly Soviet flags on the they're living off of, like, daddy's money. And then if things come to things, they're going to find themselves not up against college twinks. Not that those college twinks can't fucking do any damage. Like, have you ever seen two gay guys fight at a bar? It it gets freaking brutal. They're not just going to be up against that. They're going to be up against anarchist dad who's fighting for his kid's future. And they're going to have psyched themselves out into facing like this ridiculous. I honestly think that's why they lost at Charlottesville so bad. They psych themselves into thinking that their enemy is something, someone that their enemy isn't. Well, that's actually one of my personally favorite things to do. It's it's a little bit it's a little bit problematic, I will admit. But one of my favorite things to do when I'm you know when I'm talking guns with somebody or I'm showing off my my uh, my, my weapons and everything, and we're, we're talking about the statistics and the art and the science behind gun fighting and warfare. And I'm I'm a fairly knowledgeable person. People pick up on that pretty quickly. And some people are very mildly intimidated by it. And then they then they'll start talking politics because you cannot talk guns without talking politics anymore and my exact quote nearly every time is yeah i'm one of those uh sjw leftist cucks you've heard about and uh i will not be moved and the confusion that alights on their face like a moth to a flame is just this is problematic but it is the most gratifying thing well yeah because it, it counters their narrative it's not what they expect ice and border patrol it's 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 lit up like crazy this week before we go into the big stuff here, I did want to go over uh, a couple. I don't like to call them smaller stories, but they, they kind of like fill in the narrative of everything that's behind this. And one of the things that I did want to point out is just how out of control U.S. Customs and Border Protection is right now. People are genuinely afraid of these people, U.S. citizens, because there's so little accountability in what they do. And Task and Purpose ran an article where a U.S. veteran was intimidated by a Border Patrol agent. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't violate any rules. And the Border Patrol agent knew this because they were watching him the entire time. Basically, he was just on a ride in Vermont he reached the the border obelisk post he did not cross it he stopped before he got got close to it he turned his vehicle around and the border patrol agent got out of their vehicle approached the person began yelling accusing them of breaking the law and of illegal entry this was a guy that he did border patrol in iraq and he said that he felt he felt like he was in danger and being unlawfully intimidated. Uh, if I if I remember the story correctly, he and his wife were on vacation at the time, and he noticed this white SUV. They blocked his path and accosted he and his wife with weapons drawn and insinuations, or not insinuations, flat out accusations that they were illegally crossing the border. The first agent to make contact began by yelling at them and telling them that they had them on video crossing the border, which was flatly a lie as they had not done so at all. And he was so spooked by this as the second agent was arriving again with their weapon out. He wrote his sister's phone number on his wife's arm in case they got separated and she had to call for bail. And he got on Facebook and put up a status on Facebook and on Twitter about what was going on with them in case they uh, they disappeared. Because he noted when he was telling reporters about this that they were out in the middle of nowhere. And if something regrettable happens, it's the Border Patrol's words against theirs. There were no real witnesses out there. He was terrified. This is a man who served overseas in a war zone as checkpoint security. And he was terrified by the law enforcement agency at our borders. That says something deeply distressing about the state of our policing. To top that off, uh, a few days later, after this story came out, uh, we have the story of the Native American who just get flat out ran over by a border patrol uh, because he whipped out his phone and was recording them on Native American grounds, which... I'm guessing that maybe they just didn't have the right to be there, but they ran him over, did not stop. They actually turned their lights on 
and sped away because they know that they screwed up. Yeah, the gentleman in question, uh, Paolo Remis, he was at his parents' house on the uh, on the reservation, which is, I'll remind you, just on the Mexico border there, and he saw a border patrol vehicle kind of sulking around the, the area, and, you know, being the situation with border patrol how it is, he, uh, he decided to draw out his, his cell phone camera and record them. He said immediately, as soon as he did so, they accelerated toward him, and actually swerved in order to hit him, which, just by watching the video, you can tell is not a lie. That was, they elected to hit him. I, I suspect they panicked, but after they hit him, they didn't, they didn't stop, they didn't turn around, they didn't even slow. They hit their sirens and sped out of the area. But just another example here of just how crazy the situation here is with ICE is that there was another guy, Pablo Villavicencio. He was a pizza delivery man. He delivered a pizza to an army base, Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. And it sounds like he'd done this multiple times before and had no problem with it. But for whatever reason, the guard that particular day asked for his ID. He produced a city-based ID. The guard said that that would not be official for that purpose because apparently anybody could get a New York City ID was the accusation there. He demanded to see like a New York State ID or some other form and he couldn't produce it. So they claimed that he signed a document stating that he okayed a background check. And when the background check came through, it turned out that he had an ICE warrant from 2011. However, he had been married to a woman since then and had a right to be in the United States, being that he was married to a U.S. citizen and had kids as well. So here's a working class guy that just gets arrested for doing his job. There are a couple of things, interesting things about this case in particular that strike me. Firstly, the the fact of a lot of the other restaurants in Brooklyn basically, I wouldn't say boycotting, but refusing to deliver to the base anymore because they're scared of their people getting snatched up. And in, in a couple of statements, just as a show of working class solidarity, which is genuinely inspiring. And aside from that, in my experience being on government property, uh, military bases, police stations and the like, if you're in a secured area and they catch you there, or if you try to gain access to a secured area and you're stopped by a checkpoint or a guard, they ask you for your ID and your reason for being there. If you don't have sufficient identification and a reasonable purpose for being there or trying to gain access to there, they simply escort you off of the property. Again, that might just be my white privilege speaking, but in my experience, every single time that you're found wanting, they simply compel you to leave. Exactly. It seems like it was an overreach of power because they could have just said, well, that's not an official ID for this purposes. Just give me the boxes. I'll sign for it and I'll call the guy up to pick up his meal. Thank you very much. Go home. They didn't have to run any background checks or anything like that. Uh, they didn't have to ask him whether or not he was going to be there that, or whether or not he had the right to be there. That's none of their business, even whether he is or is not a U.S. citizen, unless they find some suspicion that him having some motivation to do harm to the base. And that ties into uh, another thing that is somewhat concerning about the case. According to statements from other restaurant owners and delivery personnel in the area who frequently deliver to that base, this is the only notable incident where this has happened. Nobody else previous to this claims to have had any kind of problem like this. And that it actually includes like a Cuban deli as well. So, so maybe there was a change in protocol, but why wouldn't they announce that? Maybe the guy just wasn't doing his job before, but... The odds of every other gate guard not doing their job and this guy just going above and beyond and earning his paycheck, the odds against that are staggering. And the delivery man in question, Vivencio, I believe, he stated that he thinks that that particular guard had something against him in particular, which, you know, that, that raises even more questions. It's unequal enforcement either way big story that of course happened this week and it's actually kind of two, twofold and it's it's both related the first one was president trump's administration wants to open up open air tent cities 
I guess you could call them concentration camps at this point. Well, let's why not? Detainment facilities to hold between 1,000 and 5,000 children because they're running out of room in their current facilities. So the new tent city that they're looking to build, uh, they're wanting to do it uh, near Fort Bliss at Dias Air Force Base or Goodfellow Air Force Base. And of course, the reasoning right now is that there are 11,200 children in over 100 so-called shelters, if you will. And those shelters are, on average, are filled to 95% capacity right now. Uh, another fun thing to mention is this this administration, while they didn't particularly name drop Joe Arpaio, um, any of us might remember a year or so ago the incredible debacle with Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his tent cities and the absolutely unacceptable conditions of said tent cities. It's very easy to look at this new idea and uh, stop wondering where it came from. One thing I, I will really congratulate <clears throat> liberals on and liberal media on is that they are actually using the term camps like they're actually using the term concentration camps and that is exactly what you need to call them but another thing i want to know is like why are we unable to talk about the fact that these have existed since 2014 like they haven't been filled to the brim since 2014 but like the first of these started popping up in 2014 under Obama. That's a great point there. Why are we not allowed to talk about what happened under Obama? And I think the answer there is obvious given the bias in the media. The media is, of course, a very partisan industry, if, even if they don't like to pretend. They're not coming at it with this consciousness like we're looking at it. They're not looking at it step back away from Republican and Democrat looking at it from a, a socialist view, if you will. They're looking at this as being a Republican versus Democrat thing. And because it ramped up under Trump, Trump has to be the problem. Well, the thing is, Obama is our precious good boy president who promised change and delivered. And, you know, he's a liberal, so he's part of hashtag the resistance. I really want to know how many people Hillary Clinton would have put in the camps. Like, I want to know how many people would have excused her for doing so. Would have found a reason for saying, oh, it's, it's actually a good thing because she's protecting Americans, keeping us safe, and, and making sure that our jobs uh, stay safe and secure as well. Well, they probably would have been nicer, ritzier camps anyway, because George Soros would have been funding them. Jeez, that's depressing. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a take. <laughs> you have actually a point here when it comes to the funding on the, the issue. It has been more expensive for the government to separate out these kids from their families. And it's admitted that that's so. And every time the government tries to excuse this, they always point the finger at the Democrats and say, well, oh, it's because of laws they passed and everything when it turns out that's not the case. That's not what's on the books. And the Trump administration is doing this both as a deterrent and as a message. Yes, they're using children in concentration camps as political leverage on the inside, on the American side of things. They're trying to make a point with this. It is explicitly more expensive. They have no problem admitting that, and that very effectively underlines the purpose behind all of this. And, and you know the funny thing about that is, despite the fact that it is more expensive, you don't hear the fiscal conservatives coming out denouncing this, which really tells you where their values really lie. No, no, because you know it would be even more expensive than expensively putting them in expensive concentration camps. Letting them come in here and take our jobs. Letting them come in here and bring in crime and drugs and MS-13 and be rapists. That's the most expensive solution. Not just financially for our tax-funded police system, but also in a human way. Consider the human cost of letting these immigrants come in here, maybe infiltrated by terrorists, and bring their weapons and their crime and their drugs and their gangs. You have any idea how hard MS-13 has hit the social fabric of this country? 
He's making America great again. And the fact that it's going to cost a little bit more than housing all of them together so that they can sit next to one another in the concentration camps and plot and, and you, you know, surveillance. you know what though, and that's exactly the 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 reason that they're gonna give you. They're they're gonna bring out these false statistics about MS thirteen. Uh, when the fact is, is that there's only about three thousand to maybe five thousand upper estimate of MS thirteen members in the United States active right now. So the, that is to say that even by our most generous estimates. There are fewer active members of MS-13, many of whom, I imagine, don't engage in aggressive gang-like activities, whatever those may be. There are fewer active MS-13 members in the U.S. right now than there are literal children in actual concentration camps. Yes, uh, and that's just the children. In the midst of all this, Senator Jeff Merkley actually tried to visit one of these detention facilities even though he was a senator and he has an entourage, you know, showing off who he is and what his credentials are, they just flat out refused him and turned him around. They actually, they called the cops on him so that the cops could show up and I guess intimidate him, push him around a bit as well. He had a list of questions written down, was didn't he? Yes, he did. He had like a, a 19 question a letter that he actually drafted up after visiting the facility that DHS actually didn't respond to. Instead, what DHS did is they turned the entire situation about his visit around and said that he was the problem. So basically what DHS did was they released a report saying, how dare you, how dare you, ask questions about these children. How dare you demand to see it? Because this is a violation of these kids' privacy. Do you understand what you're doing here? You are putting these kids at risk. You're wanting to make a show of their lives for political gain. That's literally what the White House did. And then to top, top it all off, they also added in a dash of accusing him of illegalism because it would have violated laws had they let him in. Good heavens, I read that. And this is this is not a new thing for me. Since this administration, I have become accustomed to reading things written by the actual government that are that level of just confusing filth. And I, I was a little bit blown back, even given those circumstances, because... Jeff, you want to come in and exploit these children for, for political gain? Or are you, some kind of, are you some kind of sicko that just wants to come in here and look at all of this? You disgust me. Like, wow, really? Do you think that this will be like the moment, like the catalyzing moment for liberals that they have to do something more than phone calls? I would hope so. Um, at least a few. Because I'll tell you what, if I was a liberal up till now, uh, this would be swinging me pretty hard left. Like, they're camps. And there's no way they can obfuscate their camps. No matter what word they use, they're camps. And they're going to build even more obvious tent camps. There's no obfuscating the parallel. There's no doing the liberal wishy-washy. Well, it's not as bad as, or it's not to that point yet, or we still have time. We can still make phone calls. A year! A year they've wasted making phone calls. A year they've wasted writing letters. A year they've wasted. Well, hun, better late than never. There was some good that came of uh, Merkel not being allowed in there. Is uh, They caved and a cadre of reporters descended upon the facility. And, who boy, oh, the images God, the, yeah, and the, the, the writings were distressing. There are murals of Trump everywhere i guess with utterly nonsensical quotes uh, so, so, sometimes in losing a battle you find a way to win the war what sense does that make in this context is that supposed to inspire these kids it's written in english to the right of his head which you know but it's written in spanish to the left of his head and you you wonder like how are these kids gonna take that coming in here being dragged away from everything they know and love they see the guy who's pretty much directly responsible for it and they see this quote about losing a battle and winning a war. Like, what effect is that going to have on them? I will tell you, if I was in the same shoes and I saw that quote on the wall next to the guy that this is causing, this is the guy that's causing this misery, the war that I would be fighting would be against that guy. Like, that would have radicalized me to the honestly to the point of violence. I mean, just seeing 
the conditions within this facility it's basically white sterile cubicles because it's in an old walmart so they partitioned it off into like these cubicles put beds in there put play areas in and, and stuff like that but everything is very sterile it's it's whitewashed like literally like everything is like blank it's very depressing to look at well, these kids evidently get two hours a day to themselves. One hour to go out and play with one another, and one hour to, I think, watch Moana was what they were doing when these reporters came through. And even then, even looking at these circumstances and thinking, well, at least there are no smoking chimneys and weird showers. As Harry Leslie Smith, this fella, uh, tweeted, I would warn journalists who are visiting some of these migrant camps for children in America that show migrant kids playing that the Nazis also built the Riesenstadt to show the world press and the Red Cross how well Jews were treated in concentration camps. Now, this this has me worried because who knows what they were doing before Merkley was there. Like, they may exactly. have anticipated the fact that reporters were going to come in and they were like, okay, so we need to clean this place up as, as much as possible, whitewash it down. We let the reporters in. Uh, we show them that nothing's going on, that there's no abuses, anything like that. And he did a bad job of that then. Well, I mean, it's exactly like when, you're, when your mom tries to come into your room to see how you're doing and you're like, no, 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 don't come in, don't come in. And you lock the door, you hide the XL Thor under your bed, and you, you kick the, the two-gallon drum of Bad Dragon cum lube under the table, and then your mom asks your sister to come in to see how you're doing, and your sister goes in there and goes, well, they're still weird, but, you know, everything seems okay. It's exactly that kind of situation. It's just, give me some time. To put the ovens in the back and get them behind a partition. and Kids, kids, play. Look happy. Look good. There was actually a senator that was able to interview some the immigrant women that were being held that had their kids ripped from them. And she had said that a third of the women that she had interviewed out of 170 lost their children. One of them even told them that when the process was happening that... She could hear her kid in the next room, like, screaming. That shows you the kind of inhumanity and horror that these people are, are willing to go to. That is haunting. And it's genuinely hard to process reading something like that. Reading about a woman hearing her child screaming in the next room. That's some young adult dystopian world novel kind of thing to read. But it's here. It's happening right now. We are in the bad timeline. Yeah, and, and I think, like Attica said, it's definitely time that liberals wake up to this kind of stuff because if they don't, it's not going to be the immigrants that are going to be put in the camps. Eventually, this scope is going to increase. This is, this is a trial run. Like, this is... This eerily reminds me a little bit of the Rex 84 program under Reagan that was proposed or like even the conspiracy theory of the, the FEMA camps that they were going to activate them for concentration camps after uh, 9-11, that theory that was floating around. This all too eerily has too much parallels to this under an administration that has shown time and time again that it cannot be trusted. With these people in power, can we really entrust them knowing that they're operating these kind of things come 2020, that they're going to do the right thing? Well, that is a good point. There is there is a considerable amount of evidence for things like this having been proposed in the relatively recent past of our country. And it's an incontrovertible fact that this all was going on before Trump. This is something a long time coming. And as much as it's refreshing to see the media picking up on this and news stories about it cycling, as much as it's good to see people realizing this and getting mad, getting radical, getting serious about trying to fix it, it's really unsettling to see how far this has come before people start doing anything about it. And there's not even a guarantee that anything large scale is going to be done about this anytime soon. This could escalate into a full-blown Holocaust-style genocide of migrants and their children on our soil. This could very well become Nazi Germany 2.0. And the thought of that 
is so profoundly disquieting that people are just completely unable to to reconcile it or or try to deal with it or come to terms with it. Everyone's going, look, it's not going to get that bad. We're America. We won't let it get that bad. I, the moment Trump won, I was prepared. To, I knew that this that's what this was going to be. Like, everyone else is just kidding themselves. And it's the most painful thing about this is hasn't even been watching Trump do Trump's bullshit. It's been watching. It's been waiting for the rest of the fucking world to stop trying to barter with themselves. Oh, it's not going to be that bad. Or, oh, we'll let Trump do this, but not this. And he'll be happy. And that's been the most painful part. Not even everything that Trump's doing, but the waiting for liberals, honestly, just waiting for liberals. Because you can't get them out of the way because they won't get out of the way. They just fucking say you're as bad as Trump and call you a Russian bot and fucking kick you under the rug and make you go away. So you can't, you can't get past them. You just kind of have to wait wait for them to let so much damage be caused and then they don't know what to do and then you can actually step in as a leftist and get something done hopefully dear god by the way i want to skip ahead not to not to our next story but the one after that because it kind of connects into everything that i said and i'm surprised i actually didn't realize this earlier department of homeland security is building a biometric database that will interact and connect with their existing databases, mining information for communications that they already have. It's called the Homeland Advanced Recognition Technology, or HART, and it's going to be the biggest biometric database ever created, at least in the United States. This is basically what China is trying to build right now. It's going to have fingerprint dna facial scans uh, data on tattoos and scars the system will be able to scan social media accounts to discern behavior based off of things like posts like comments common interests between people and also try to tie in like relationships based off of that so it'll assume that you associate with so and so because of said activity then to top it all off, of course, it's, it's going to be used by all the three-letter agencies, that's DHS, ICE, FBI, uh, to track people eventually in real time. That's, that's what they want to do. You're looking at a future where police departments, three-letter agencies, etc. will be able to put on some glasses and scan a crowd just like they're able to do in China right now and say that person's got a warrant we got to get them this person doesn't belong in the country we got to grab them which the idea of a database like that existing is a really sobering thought for all of us who go to the rallies and and, and wear the masks it's like so basically do I need to staple a balaclava to the back of my head like indefinitely you know hashtag delete your fucking Facebook Definitely, if you've not done so, look into deleting your Facebook. I've already done so myself. After the whole Cambridge Analytica thing, I just felt like I couldn't trust them because not only did it turn out that they gave the information, but I actually never did anything. It was my friends that used some application and my information got scraped. And then the come to find out, Facebook gave this information or at least was giving it away way after the cutoff time that they said they were going to stop. So even with that, I mean, that's discerning in itself. But the fact the federal government is doing this and they want it to be real time and everything, this is hugely problematic because these systems, these facial identification systems routinely misidentify people of color, African-Americans uh, in, in the UK. Their system was as bad as 95% of people flagged were innocent. So these systems are not some panacea and it's going to cause a lot of people a lot of problems and it's going to put people in danger because more people are going to get flagged over a false positive than are going to actually be flagged because they actually did something to supposedly warrant being called. Those are just stumbling blocks to progress. You know what progress means in this country is freedom. You have a problem with progress or freedom, Phelan? If a few people who didn't do anything get locked up, 
in order to have a system that for the indefinite future will find a find criminals and terrorists and keep them away from the all of the nice <laughs> rich white society so be it this is the security of our nation we're talking about and it sounds like you don't care very much about the commonwealth of the american people you sound like a communist i you do that too I'm, well and it's scary he, he does he's, he's had practice i could tell <laughs> I spent a great deal of my life in a situation where I had to be very, very good at being really mean, heartless little bastard. And those scars are, are still pretty evident in my behavior. I mean, that is the authoritarian logic on the matter. The fact is, though, is eventually one of the, these bourgeois people are going to get caught up in this and they're going to find out it's not going to be so fun for them. And then that's the excuse they're going to be given yeah, they may get awarded a little bit of money, and that's assuming they survive. Uh, one thing I'd like to harken back to on, on, on the discussion about the uh, the conditions of these concentration camps is on Leftygram, Fibersynth posted something very interesting. It's a quote from an article. To begin the quote, uh, Michelle Brain, director of migrant rights at the Women's Refugee Commission, met with a 16-year-old girl who had been taking care of a young girl for three days. The teen and others in their cage thought the girl was two years old. She had to teach other kids in the cell to change her diaper, Brain said. Brain said that after an attorney started to ask questions, agents found the girl's aunt and reunited the two. It turned out that the girl was actually four years old. Part of the problem was that she didn't speak Spanish, but he, language indigenous to Guatemala, she was so traumatized that she wasn't talking, Brain said. She was just curled up in a little ball. And later in this article, one of the uh, Border Patrol guys was quoted, being, of course, surrounded by sobbing and wailing children. He was quoted as saying, what we've got here is an orchestra. All we need is a conductor. I don't care who you are. I don't care how else you might perceive that. That is chilling. The stories that come out of these places are just, they're horrible. If, if four or five years ago you would have asked me if this would have been happening in this country, I would have said that you're crazy. It's just the amount of shamelessness our administration has and the lack of humanity is just absolutely disgusting. The depth are willing to go to pull us down into this hell are unfathomably just it's unfathomable i mean it's it's pretty obvious that in this case the emperor wears no clothes but his cabinet and all the sycophants around him are trying to insist to us that that's okay because you know who wears clothes nazis and we're not nazis we're just doing what's best for everyone but yeah i wanted to to, to bring up the heart thing just in conjunction with with all of this because with them creating these camps and with yet another system to spy on the american people make connections and with the lack of accountability all they have to say to the public is this person's an immigrant or whatever and if the reporters can't get to you to find out if this is true or not you're just going to disappear well here's a very fun thought Let's go back to Nazi Germany. Everyone talks about all of the Jews that died in the Holocaust that were sent into the camps. And yes, they were political enemy number one for Nazi Germany. But bear in mind that after there were camps, they just shoved everyone they didn't like in there. There were also Romani. There were also homosexuals. There were also the disabled in these camps. And that same thing might very well be applied in the future. Now that there are camps for refugees, now that there are camps for people who illegally cross the borders, now, now that there are camps for the unwanted members of humanity that we don't want to accept into our society, if you're a political dissident or if, if you're some other kind of degenerate who might pose a pernicious threat to the state of American society, then they might just say, well, you know what, throw them in there with the refugees and we'll deport them along with them and in that possible future, deport might very well be a handy euphemism for pitching an oven. I do want to remind the audience, it is no conspiracy. You need to look up Rex 84. This was an exercise done under Reagan that could have been used during a coup d'etat or really just any incident to declare a national emergency in, these country, in this country. 
And they would execute what was called COG, which is continuity of government, where they basically, the executive takes over the entire function of the government. And with this already in place, with heart being developed in a few years, you have something like this come along, all of a sudden it, it, the game has changed. The, the groundwork for fascism in this country is being laid down by law and by infrastructure now. Like, we are building the infrastructure in this country for hardcore authoritarian oppression and leftists need to get it together because if we don't, we could be in some really hard times because we don't know how these facilities are going to be used in the future. A lot of times when you create institutions like these, they don't simply go away. And all the leftists who are thinking like, oh, well, you know, it's capitalism is just going to collapse under its own weight and we don't have to worry about it or do anything. No, shut up. And all the Dem socks and sock Dems who are, you know, oh, we got to do something, but we can't actually do anything that's too much of doing something because that would be bad and wrong and people might get hurt. Like, there's camps. There's concentration camps. Shut the fuck up. Do something. Block a street. Than something. Okay, so capitalism collapses under its own weight in this country. And the government says, well, this is a huge recession. There are people starving in the streets. Our nation is falling apart because goods and services just aren't moved around like capitalism did for so long. Let's institute something. Let's institute socialism. But we, we don't have the wherewithal to go and help everybody. So it'll be socialism for America. Our economic policy will still be trading overseas. But here... It will be socialist, okay? We'll just give everyone what they need. It'll be a, a form of socialism, but national. It'll, it'll, be, a, it'll national be a national socialism, socialism if you will, like, like a, a Nazism kind of. Exactly, because what were the pre-existing conditions for the National Socialist Party to rise to power so quickly and so effectively in pre-Nazi Germany? But, there was a massive recession following a war that they got stomped in. But don't worry, because they'll get about three, four years in power, and then the socialist branch will create a ruckus, and then all of a sudden, oh, we, we got to get rid of these people, so they'll just kill them off. On our next story here, we had two court rulings here, and it was like one step forward or two steps back, or maybe it's the other way around. I, I'm really not sure of, of what to fully make of this. The good news... I want to start with this first. The Arizona Appeals Court upheld a ruling affirming a Phoenix law protecting LGBT people from discrimination from businesses under constitutional grounds. Basically, what happened was the whole same-sex wedding incident involving not a cake this time, but wedding invitations. The argument put forth from the business owner was that they felt that they did not have to make a full invitation for a gay couple or a lesbian couple, but they could still serve them generally. What they wanted to do was tell them, no, we're not going to serve you this way, but we got some pre-made invitations here and you guys can use these. Well, I mean, I can kind of see the point there because if I make wedding invitations and a couple of neo-Nazis come in and they're, they're such a sweet, nice couple and they go, we're getting married in July, and we'd like wedding invitations that, that say no queers and no Jews. You know, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, my friend, I cannot do that. And I'm going to give them my pre-made wedding invitations that say smash the fash. Here's where this analogy doesn't actually work. So the city of Phoenix has a law on the books that says that you cannot discriminate against certain classes. And one of those classes is LGBT peoples. Under the law itself, it simply just states that you can't discriminate. Now, of course, there's a double-edged sword here. If Nazis wanted to get protection, they could just write themselves in. Right now... I was just going to say, yeah. give this administration another two years. But my scenario is very flawed in that that's literally hate speech. That wouldn't fly either way. I just kind of wanted to deconstruct it for, for our listeners but, there. Because it is something that uh, somebody on the right might do because they love playing these games. Exactly. You had to turn it into some 
horrible dystopian idea about what if Nazis were a protected class. And I wouldn't be super upset about that, except that might be in our future. It's so ridiculous. Well, I mean, that's kind of a hallmark of our administration so far, is ridiculous and scary. Ridiculous in the literal sense, as in worthy of ridicule. Attica, I did want to get your take on it because you live in the Phoenix area. So was this like a big thing? Like were there parties in the streets over this in Phoenix? No. Like gay people here care about not being lynched, not not getting married. Who the fuck can a gay, who can afford a marriage? It's This is kind of such a non-issue for most gay people because most gay people are poor people. And I'm sorry, but this like cool if you can afford to get married, but you can afford to get married if you're like, Gay Bob, who works in accounting and makes like hundred thousand dollars a year. That's, that's like that's like the story of our generation, though. I mean, can't afford to do anything. Well, as some absolute cutie pointed out on Twitter, we don't care about cakes. Stop talking about cakes. We care about not getting beaten down at school. We care about not being singled out by state violence from the police. We care about not being turned out of our homes by our parent because we come out of the closet. We don't care that much about cakes. And I, I think the issue here is less cakes and weddings than it is a statement overall about how deeply homophobic our society really is. And even with the leaps and bounds we, we, we've made in decriminalizing homosexuality and legalizing gay marriage, there is still a very serious problem that American culture has with LGBT uh, communities. The whole issue around discrimination, of course, should the this, this surface level talk about cakes and, and, and whatnot, that, that's not really the stuff that, that matters. Everybody's like focusing on like the one situation. For the most part, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people that are stepping back and looking at this, where it's, it's not just about somebody not being served by a private business. Yeah, that's a problem. You're right. There are people being kicked out of their, their homes for being gay, disowned by their family for being gay. And God forbid the, the, the shit that trans people have to deal with because it's like that, but like a hundred times worse because they're getting it from bigots that, that, that are gay as well because they can, that's that they feel that that's their turn now, as nasty as that seems. And really, it needs to stop. Well, I think overall it's indicative of an institutional and cultural unwillingness or inability even to talk about the more serious issues. And as a stand-in for the more serious issues, such as the fact that trans women of color are one of the most, are statistically one of the most uh, victimized classes of people in our society, and all of, the, all of the kids being thrown out of their homes for being gay, I think that if we're unable or unwilling to candidly discuss the real issues, it works as a stand-in. But if that's going to be the sole focus of LGBT discourse in this country, then yes, we need to talk about something other than wedding cakes and wedding invitations. Soon it'll be, it'll be wedding limousines or, or, or wedding cans on the back of your mid-sized sedan, and we don't need that. We need a very real and very honest discourse about how deeply homophobic and transphobic our country really is. But no one cares about that because you can't sell that. You can sell a rainbow cake. You can at your grocery store, you know, you can put up a big rainbow banner and say, we serve the gays and make a bunch of money. You can market that. You can't market actual liberation. If No. I mean, that's why the cake thing is an issue because... It, capital has allowed it to be an issue because there's, ha you know, portions of the bourgeois that hate the gays and there's portions of the bourgeois who look at them and say, oh, money, money's here. Let's get money. That's so, why the cake is an issue and why the killing of trans people in the streets isn't. Are you trying to imply that this level of discrimination, the, 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 the racism and the homophobia and everything is actually conducive to the financial interests of large businesses because without it, all of their cool diversity posters and billboards and television news ads would not be effective in bringing in a, a, a greater amount of capital and bringing in new clientele. Is, is that the point you're driving here? You know, that takes what I was saying further, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I didn't even like make that. I didn't make the whole connection of, well, they've got to keep the homophobia going because then they can't sell rainbow cakes. But 
yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Unfortunately, like this was there, there was a blowback on a Supreme Court case. It was exactly that. And it turned out that it was a procedural issue with the court case. So the good news is with this, even though the court ruled in favor of the bigots, they did so because the board in Colorado really did not address the situation in a legally appropriate manner. So what this actually does mean is that this particular constitutional issue is not done and we just need to find the right case to push through and it may even be a refiling of this particular case. So the current ruling was bad, but there's still hope here that from a constitutional standpoint, what was done was wrong and it can be rectified here and that these kind of protections can and of course should be put in place. So it could feasibly be brought up in court on a different case, this same point about denying service to LGBTQ people. Exactly, because of the way that the Colorado board treated the people that brought the case forward because they said that they felt like they were being discriminated against for being religious and they weren't given the proper representation to put forward their case. The last part of the story, though, that I did want to go over, though, uh, does kind of tie into the, the kind of bigotry, though, that Attica uh, was talking about. There's a story that's been floating around that a Tennessee shop owner, right after the court ruling, the Supreme Court ruling, not the Arizona one, posted a sign outside his building stating that no gays were allowed. So this story is actually being used as propaganda. This shop owner did not put the sign out in regards to this ruling. He has had this sign up since 2015. So this is not something new that he's done and it's getting floated around like it's a, it's a new thing. And what these kind of stories do when we float them around and they're not true like this, this emboldens the right. We need to be very careful about this because one, truthfulness, but two, they can also take this and they can claim it and say, yeah, so this is a victory and it's time to celebrate and this is how we're going to celebrate. And we could be pushing that narrative unknowingly by spreading these false stories like this. So this is an example of fake news coming out of some do-good media organizations that think that they know better than us what they should uh, publish. Honestly, I think it's sad, but it's also a little bit uh, inspiring that not one episode of this podcast can go by without us having to give some PSA about uh, some kind of alt-right news media psyop. And uh, on that note, has anyone here heard about the Drop the Bee campaign? Yes, I've heard about Drop the Bee. So LGBT, they want to drop the bee because there's there's no two there's more than two genders, all that, and they're trying to apply it to corrupt the uh, the movement and so uh, discord into uh, the LGBT community. But jokes on them because it turns out LGBT community there's pretty smart cookies there. Who would have guessed? I mean, like, geez. So. Look at the people like spreading it. These people are so bad. They can't even like hide the fact that this is who they are. They use their main profiles, for instance. But the other thing is, is like they can't even create a message without like stepping outside of themselves. It's so obvious. And it's really neat to see how quickly it was caught within a, I don't know how quickly I jumped on this train, but the second day that I was seeing the Drop the Bee campaign spread around Tumblr, Facebook, and Twitter, I saw screen grabs from the poll board of 4chan with, I'm going to try to quote this directly and it's going to hurt to say it, let's destroy the left the way the trannies destroyed the LGBT community. Or no, the way the trannies destroyed the queers. That is absolutely indicative of the mindset here. It's nothing but a, a political battleground for them. They absolutely don't care about anything except these tiny, petty hit-and-run tactics and especially in the case of the Drop the Bee campaign, as it's called, this really shows. So what you were saying about how fast this whole thing was caught on Twitter and it was found on poll. I mean, just instinctively, though, like I knew, like I knew like the second that I looked at this, like this was 
just BS. It was so, it was just way too obvious. And that's the thing, like I said, these people, they, they're incapable of stepping outside of themselves. It's on the internet. So there's obviously going to be some level of skepticism in my mind. I was just, when I actually found confirmation that it wasn't what it appeared to be on the surface, how quickly I found that confirmation and the absolute agility with which, a broad term here, the absolute agility with which the left is beginning to find these things out and debunk them. I would say in this case, the, the desperation and half-assedness of the tactics being used by some elements of the right is really nice to see. That kind of solidarity in leftism, that, that kind of active forward thinking, that, that skepticism is really great to see. And the thing with the, the guy in, in the town hall in Seattle, on top of that, it's really, it makes me feel good to know our movement is more than a few angry weirdos online. And right now, things are moving rather quickly toward a very, very ugly possible future. As unsettling as it is, as, as, as terrifying as it is, it is just absolutely great to watch the left move and act and be. To all of our listeners and to anyone who might pick this up 10 years in the future, to you two, thank you so much for, for just being part of the best solution that we have. Thank you for having the, the guts to look through all of the news stories, to ask the hard questions, to say the difficult things, to add to the dialogue and constantly debate and think over what is the best way to, to take our movement forward and to actually get out there, get into the streets, engage in direct action and try to implement some of the best solutions we come up with. This is good. This is healthy. This is what the world needs right now. Genuinely, this is what the world needs. And I'm happy to see it functioning at all. Yeah, that, that first story. Because would... even if we lose, at least we'll have done something, right? At least we didn't just call it quits at phone calls. That's oh, so true. I mean, Ooh, just call out. I really like, I'm so done with them. I just, I, I like there's camps. I have no more patience for their stupid games, for their, their canvassing. And there's, we got to vote in midterms and their uh, phone calls and letters. It's I'm done. There are camps. I'm done. I'm done with their bullshit. Do something. Yeah. But what you said, just it, it absolutely gives me hope for the future. Because people are going out there. Like when I saw that video, like I I knew there's more people out there like this. Like this guy's not just some aberration. And these people, a lot of these people that did fight for this country, that that joined the army and stuff like that. I used to work for an institution that used to uh, do business with these people and serve these people. These people, they legitly care about the people for the most part. So this kind of thing doesn't surprise me. I, I would be very, very hard pressed to say that, that, that this guy is like a, a one of a kind thing. No, this is this is probably something closer to the norm. So with that all being said today, uh, I did want to thank our listeners. We're going to be doing a bonus episode this week, by the way. It's going to be coming out very soon. We had so much, we could not cover it all in one episode, and we did not want to inundate you with a three-hour-long episode. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be dropping very soon. If you like what we do, like, comment, subscribe to our SoundCloud or to our YouTube. We'd really very much appreciate that. Stay tuned to our Twitter. We're going to have some announcements there coming up very soon on how you could support the Enceladus Stations Network. So with that all being said, from the far side of Enceladus, good night and good luck.